Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Gavin Cleesbees, uh, and I'm the Director of Programs, Exhibitions, and Community Partnerships for the Massachusetts Historical Society. I'm happy to welcome everyone to our program. Uh, I'm sorry that we're not able to all be here in person, uh, but I'm hopeful that we'll be gathering together soon. Uh, just to give people a, a brief heads up, um, one of our panelists uh, is in the room with me, uh, and everyone else is joining remotely. Uh, just in case you, you wonder why two people are in giant red rooms. Uh, before we get started, uh, I also wanted to thank our co-sponsors, The History Project. Uh, this is the second year we've partnered with them for a program exploring LGBTQ history, uh, and we appreciate all the time and effort that they put into these events. I also want to thank the great team of people we worked with in planning this program. We certainly could not have done it without them. Uh, if anyone is joining the MHS, uh, for the first time, let me mention that we are the first historical society in America. We were founded uh, way back in 1791, and for the past 230 years, we have been a resource for the public. Today, we maintain a research library, have galleries open to the public, and host a wide variety of programs, for both academic and public audiences. We're only able to produce these programs because of the support of our members. Uh, we hope you'll return for future events, and we hope uh, you'll support our work by becoming a member or making a donation. Tonight we have a great discussion that will explore a uh, history that hasn't been memorialized. Uh, many important sites in queer history simply do not exist anymore. Clubs have closed, publications have shut down, buildings have been raised or radically altered, but these spaces still exist in the history and memory of the queer community. Our panelists today will discuss their memories of queer nightlife in Boston, as well as the ways uh, they have used artistic mediums to bring these spaces back to life. Uh, we are joined uh, by a great group. Uh, just to save time and to get the conversation started, I'll give very, very brief introductions. Uh, here at MHS with me is Danny Harris, uh, the founder of Elites, the first uh, black gay club in Boston. Uh, we're also joined online by Jackson Davidow, a postdoctoral fellow in the Translating Race Lab at the Center for Humanities at Tufts University, uh, Jordan West, who is an artist and a filmmaker, uh, and Indy Mitchell and Natalie Nina Falk, uh, who are the co-directors of Last Call, a collective of trans and queer artists and archivists who have been drawn together to create innovative multi-platform events and digital media that document and interpret neglected trans and queer history. So, without further ado, I think that we are going to just uh, starting out, start out with uh, having each person uh, say a little bit about who they are and what they do. Um, and so, um, uh, Danny, since you're in the room with me, do you want to sure. get started? Well, my name is Danny Harris. I'm 73 years old. I'm presently I'm retired. Um, well, I work part-time in Northeastern as an actor at the School of Pharmacy. Um, I had the first black gay club in 1971 here in Boston called Elites. The, originally, the name was Elites, e Elites, and we changed it to Elites because I didn't know how to say it right. <laughs> and it remained Elites. Um, do you, would you like to be, tell the origin how, how the club started? Sure. Well, I had just got back 1970 from Vietnam. And prior to going to Vietnam, we used to go to a club right around the club down the street called um, 1270. And at that time, um, the blacks were relegated to the second floor. I don't know if they relegated themselves or they were relegated to, and they um, were near the men's room. And they seemed quite content there. I went into the service in 1967, and um, I was only 16 when I was going there. They didn't have IDs back then checking. And uh, when I got out of service, I was 20, I just turned 21 right after I got out. And I went back to the club and it, it was still by the bathroom. And I was a little bit upset about this. And anyway, the bar upstairs on the third floor where they were, the second floor where they were at was crowded. So I went downstairs to the basement where it was a club. It was a club on every floor and a bar. And um, it was only me, the DJ, and the bartender, and he totally ignored me. I was standing right in front of him. And um, well, I won't get into details, but it was a little altercation. And I left there, and um, I was working at this club called Eat Lights as a bartender in the daytime. And it was my first job at working in food service. And the, um, the owner was, he had like seven kids, adult kids 
One was Paul, who was gay. And after the altercation um, at, at, the, um, at the 1270, I went to Paul and I said, Paul, we need to open up a black gay club. And um, the next week, we opened it up. It was a perfect storm. The father owned the club. He had a liquor license. We had everything there. And the club was closed at nighttime. So we opened it up on the weekends. And it became instant overnight success. And it was, um, we, you had to be buzzed in. And um, we only let gay people in or people with, you know, their guests in. And um, it was right in the middle of the Orchard Park projects, which was like the, the most notorious projects in Boston. And they were uh, outraged that they couldn't get into the club. The guys from the neighborhood, and they used to set the um, trash barrels on fire and stick it in front of the door, trying to burn us up and everything like that. But we um, survived, and it became quite popular. And to this day, um, people are still talking about e lights, and I. I'm also trying to keep it alive because a lot of people didn't know that it existed right in the middle of Roxbury, the ghetto. And it was unheard of. And people still can't believe that it was a place like that existed. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jackson, do you want to tell us, and thank you very much, Dan. You're more than welcome. <laughs> uh, Jackson, do you want to tell us a little bit about your work? Yes. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. So first of all, I just wanted to uh, thank you, Gavin, as well as Olivia and the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, I actually received a grant right before COVID, a fellowship um, that enabled me to do this research from MHS. It was administered by MHS. Um, and honestly, I don't think that I would have proceeded in precisely the way that I did if it weren't for this grant. So um, it's meaningful to present it in this um, way. Uh, so. I, my initial remarks today will concentrate on um, some of my recent projects related to Boston's queer nightlife histories and as someone who operates uh, between the academy, the art world and uh, queer public history, I, I worked at the uh, Stonewall National Museum and Archives in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, which like the History Project is a queer community archive, um, really interested in how we can mobilize these histories and make them um, more meaningful um, and accessible to, to contemporary audiences. So I um, have been researching um, Boston's queer nightlife history. This, this essay I wrote last year called Against Our Vanishing looked at the relationship between queer photography, nightlife spaces, and gay liberation in Boston. Um, I have uh, been interested in, in Boston, and it, it was densely packed, as you can tell from this um, uh, listing in 1974 in Gay Community News. Boston was very much a hub of activity, um, um, whether it was queer activism, um, nightlife, sex, uh, literature, culture, there was a lot going on. Uh, these just gives you a sense of, um, of some of the, these establishments that were around at that time. Um, during COVID, I, I started looking at uh, queer photography in a new way, and I, I was very interested in how the um, photographic archives of gay liberation might help us speculate on um, what a queer public culture in the wake of COVID-19 might look like. I became really fascinated with this idea of uh, gay liberation and how um, for so many people, I think there was a connection between coming out and going outside, breaking down the barriers between public and private, meeting people um, together in, in physical spaces, marching in the streets and so much more. Um, so in a time of quarantine, um, I, I was really drawn to these histories in, in new ways um, and, and really searching for a sense of public intimacy. So in this essay, I focused on three different types of nightlife spaces. Um, the other side, which was a legendary uh, drag bar in Bay Village, um, uh, the Saints, which was a lesbian uh, bar in the financial district, as well as the Pilgrim Theater, which was um, 
a, a porn theater um, with with uh, with strippers, and it was where a lot of gay men and, and a lot of men and trans women um, went for for sex and and cruising. And I focused on this photo series in particular by Christian Walker called the Theater Project, and it documents um, amazingly this this pilgrimage through. Um, through the space, uh, and it's notable that Christian Walker was one of the first gay black photographers anywhere to make openly queer work about his own communities. And I've had the privilege of uh, working closely with my friend and collaborator, Noam Purness at the Leslie Lohman Museum over the past year um, to develop an exhibition project, um, the first institutional survey of his work. Uh, so this is just to give you a sense of um, is some of these um, incredible um, shots. Um, it was turned into a book in 1985 as well, published by Nexus Press in Atlanta. Uh, so parallel to my interest in queer photography in this era in Boston, I started thinking more about um, poetry. <laughs> and this is in part uh, thanks to my relation, my friendship with Michael Bronski, who as many of you uh, know, is a, a really crucial critic and journalist and a scholar and activist and who was involved uh, intimately um, in um, Bag Rag, uh, as well as a Good Gay Poets Press, the collectives that ran both, as well as many other projects. Um, and in 2019, he wrote an essay that uh, made an argument about how crucial uh, gay poetry was to the projects, the many projects of uh, liberation at the time and um, the, the gay poetry networks that were emerging. Uh, so I, I started familiarizing myself more with uh, this very specific archive of literature uh, emanating from Boston. And uh, recently, um, this happened just a couple of days ago, actually, um, I, I collaborated with um, Boudoir, which is Boston's queer underground house and techno party on the development of um, at the first Friday event at the ICA. So there was a party of um, over a thousand people. It was their big pride event. Um, and um, I, I was really honored to be approached by um, my, my friends, um, Adam, Brendan, Matthias, Sally, and Blair. Um, and instead of focusing on photography and thinking about how, um, what these archives mean, I, I thought it would be interested, interesting rather to uh, think about poetry and, and thinking about poetry as a potential agent for um, the reconstitution of queer communities in, in physical spaces and public spaces. Um, and uh, thinking specifically about the relationship between nightlife and poetry. So we launched this uh, series of curated poems that were featured on Instagram. They were very much foregrounding theme themes of uh, public intimacy, togetherness, nightlife, and sex, and engaging with the local cityscape. Um, and it, it was really a, a, you know, a blast to um, create these posts. Um, Brendan was the designer on this project. Uh, this is an example of one post that we had um, featuring a poem called If I Ran Harvard University by Walter Borowski, who was actually Michael's partner. Um, and, you know, again, lots of dancing theme poems here by Pat M. Karras, as well as Sal Farinella. And uh, in addition to these posts, we um, recorded ourselves uh, performing the poems and the DJs, who are also brilliant, um, were able to integrate uh, this audio into their set. So I'm just going to give you an example of one, so you can hear it. I've dropped my pants for a cigarette, but I dropped more than that for your sugar-coated insults. Maulings of my soul, queen of pirates and pillaging, you have dragged me from dementia into your private cell of torture and torment. Leave me as I left you to be assassinated by our own flailing tongues. 
So that was Mix Blair performing a poem by Stephanie Beard. And so at the event itself, we had this, uh, you know, quiet poetry area where people were able to engage with these Instagram posts that were printed out. It was really sweet. People were reading the, the works to one another and engaging in a more tender way. And then outside, it was um, a really wonderful party. And I'll just pay, play this. Well, thank you so much. I'll leave it there. And I look forward to uh, talking with this incredible panel about these important histories. Thank you very much. Uh, Jordan, would you like to tell us about your work? Yeah, sure. And so excited to like start to hear all the overlapping spaces where we've been researching uh, and experiencing. It's really exciting to get to hear about. Uh, I'm a filmmaker primarily in practice. And uh, I this is my first time speaking publicly about this work and the development of this work. So forgive me for being a little bit nervous. Um, so I started a, a project about the Playland Cafe years and years ago, back in 2019. Um, but the project stemmed from learning about the People Before Highways movement in the book by Dr. Carolyn Crockett, um, who I, I, she was over at MIT at the time. I'm not sure if she's still there. Um, but learning about that, that movement opened up my eyes and opened up the research potential to digging into what Boston's history looked like as a series of overlapping systems of oppression and the role that the city played uh, in displacing a lot of different people uh, throughout the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, so after learning, learning about people before highways, um, I started looking into uh, Scully Square in the West End that, you know, as all of us know, was raised back in the 1950s. And what happened to a lot of that adult entertainment is that it congregated down in the combat zone. Um, and uh, that's where my research really started being situated is looking and trying to find a club that I would be uh, interested in learning more about in the various figures. And uh, I quickly learned that if I was looking at it from the perspective of an outsider. I would continue to look at marginalized people as cultural producers. Uh, and so I went and worked at a gay club myself. So I worked at Club Cafe for a couple of years um, throughout the pandemic as well, uh, and only left to go shoot my film. So what started out as a research project really became a, a source of community inspiration for me. So Playland is of course an amalgamation of archival material, research, personal experience. And we did turn a lot time and time again to the, the poetry and the photography of the space at the time. So looking at the work of Nan Golden, Mark Morriso, Jack Pearson, um, and highlighting them. And then also uh, the poem Playland by Mark Doty also served as a huge point of inspiration. And I'm not sure if anyone's picked up John Keane's new book, Punks. It is excellent, beautiful work and also dives into his time spent in Boston. And he directly references Playland as well. Um, so I have the book here and I'll just give you a little bit of a taste of John's work. Excellent, beautiful work, but punks, check it out. Um, but this is his poem, Playland. Uh, the sweet rustling between the ears like candy, rappers falling to the floor, memories. That night I paced the curb, watching faces vanish through a hole in the bricks as harmonies blaze from within back out towards me. Winter was stalling over Chinatown, and I had only heard the worst about this joint, the oldest gay dive in Boston. So, you know, this is just, uh, you know, I know that Danny, you've visited 
play. Yes, I did. So I'm so excited. I was one of the oldest ones then. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited to hear about your experience there. But in I don't think I can tell that publicly. <laughs> <laughs> but in trying to translate this to the screen, um, what we tried to do is really lean into the visual poetics of the space. Okay. Um, and instead of defaulting to coming out narratives, it's really about people who would have been in the space all the time. So it's about the servers, it's about the bartenders, it's okay. about the queens who move through. Um, and so that perspective of what does it mean to love a space um, and what does it mean to give your life to the cultivation and maintaining of that space um, was the perspective where, uh, we met at Playland. We meet uh, our characters at Playland. So there's barely any dialogue, which I'm sure everyone's going to be thrilled about. But when you're serving, um, you're not really talking too much about anything when you're not in front of your patron. So it really is about labor and the labor that goes into these spaces. Um, so I'm gonna try to share my screen, but forgive me, I'm a little bit clunky. And if you see my desktop, I'm so sorry. That's fine, you can. Um, so here are some of the interiors uh, that we recreated and reimagined for Playland. So it is a fictitious reimagining, but we do dabble in a little bit of history. So on, can you see my little pointer? I'm just, I'm just cursing around. Okay, cool. So this is one of the servers that we follow um, and uh, their relationship with a dishwasher develops into a lifelong friendship uh, that we kind of follow. We use queer temporality a lot in this film as well. So we're hopping through the entire lifetime of the space, rather situating ourselves, say in like the 70s and 80s where things were super fun. But we're starting way back in the 1940s uh, where there is, you know, it's Boston's a port city. We have people um, who are here serving. And the role of sailors and cultivating sex work in Boston. Um, and here, uh, I, I am excited to show this to Jackson, but the fag rag plays a little bit of a pivotal role. And we do feature uh, some audio of John talking about Charlie uh, at one of the gay pride rallies that, uh, you know, burning a Bible and the sort of fallout from that act. Um, so, just really trying to take the perspective of magical realism and reimagining what the space is like uh, when you're there 24 seven and the sort of imagination it takes to keep that new and interesting for yourself. So I'll show one more, yeah, so. That looks like Playland. <laughs> that, does it? Somewhat. They I love some it, people, okay, good, good, good. Need some pinball machines. <laughs> We, we, we took a couple, you know, we took some creative liberties, uh, of course, but yeah, it, it really is about the energy of the space, uh, yeah. the, the role memory plays in that. So it's both like we remember and not quite like we remember. So how do I make this stop share? Okay. Yes. And I'm going to clean my desktop after this too. So that's a little bit about that project. And uh, it, we got picked up by Starlight Entertainment and Artless and are set to debut sometime this fall next or next year, depending on the workflow. So very exciting. Great. Well, thank you very much. It sounds fabulous. And it, it does, uh, goes to show it's a very small world. Yes. Uh, I've been working with uh, Carolyn Crockett for more than 10 years. Wow. Uh, she's a good friend um, and, and she's, she's still at MIT. In case you oh. need to find her. <laughs> Small world. Uh, so, uh, India, Natalie, do you want to tell us a little bit about your work and um, and Mo? Yeah, for sure. I'm gonna share my screen. Natalie, do you want to say hi? Hi, my name is Indy. My pronouns are he, he, and I'm one of the co-directors of Last Call. And this is my partner in crime. Hey y'all, what's good? I'm Natalie Nia Falk. I use they, them, and she/her pronouns, and I'm the other co-director of Last Call. <laughs> 
Last call, we are a New Orleans-based role history collective um, and a group of artists and art activists and archivists. Um, so we use oral histories as seeds uh, to kind of create creative things. Um, and whether it be like theater or podcasting, et cetera, et cetera, we're really interested in, yeah, the importance of like the stories of the past, specifically like stories of less documented stories of folks, specific like people of color, black folks, um, women and lesbian and queer femme identified folks. Um, we're interested in like centering those folks and using that as seeds to create new things for us here, right here, right now. So this is the team right now. It's me, Natalie um, and Natalie. We're excited to be here. Um, I know. So Indy just basically went through all of this. <laughs> We're a collective of queer artists, trans and queer artists and activists. Um, and yeah, we came together basically by the closing dike bars that happened in New Orleans. People were wondering where were all the dike bars going? And um, we'll talk a little bit more about that, but what turned into a question, where are the dike bars in New Orleans ended up becoming this full fridge interview initiative where we found out about all of these like women and queer owned spaces um, that just weren't here today. And so. One of our first initiatives came from that, a question of where is the dike bars? Um, and there, I think Indy also talked about this too. We have four components of Last Call. One of them is a full length archive of oral history interviews. Um, one is a podcast series that kind of shortened those interviews into really like digestible stories from all types of themes. Um, there are community events that bring trans and queer people together across all of the different identity classes, right? It's intergenerational, it's multiracial, um, it's folks who would of all varying genders. And the last thing that we do is we turn those oral histories into live performance. Again, Indy kind of touched up on that. Um, our oral history practice is participatory from start to finish, which means the same people are the people that we're interviewing have full disclosure on what exactly happens to the oral history. Um, there's a lengthy discussion at the top about what we want to talk about, what we want to capture. And at any point in the process, whether it's during the interview, before the interview, whatever we creatively manifest from the interview, the person can be like, no, that's not cute. Or no, you need to take that out the show. Um, it's clear that we're not, we don't own anyone's stories. We are just getting access to people's stories. And um, after we interview people, it's collectively created. So not only is the interview process participatory, but also the collection, the creative process after it. So we're not gonna create a stage piece that isn't about the bias theater. Um, we're not gonna create a podcast series that isn't about collectively inviting people in to learn the skills to develop podcasts. It shifted focus. It started off very white, which is very, you know, which is beautiful. It was very white and lesbian. Um, and over time, our work has become centered in black trans aesthetic, which means that while we're still covering all those other stories, we've broadened the narrative um, of what does it mean to be trans and queer in our oral history practice to include and to center Black trans folks. And it encourages skill and intergenerational community building. So again, we don't ever just do any project just because, um, well, it's, it's beautiful enough just for the sake of documenting and telling our stories, but our work is really rooted in developing the skills of the community. So if we're doing an oral history series, um, it's gonna be about teaching people how to become community historians. If we're creating data, it's gonna develop people's skills around creating um, theater. <laughs> Can I um, interject something here? Um, I was um, fortunate enough to um, be one of your participants in oral history. And it changed with India. I think we, we had delegated, uh, relegated an hour, and three hours later, <laughs> we were talking. And because of that, I was inspired in, um, to, to do an oral history, a one-man show. And um, I, I broke the ice by doing a one-man show with my, about my grandmother's one-liners just to get, you know, in, acclimated into doing such a thing. And I'm presently working on my one-man show. It's because of you, Indy. You got me. Oh, my goodness, Indy. What I'm telling you that because you disappeared. <laughs> that is so So funny. thank you. Thank you. I mean, because I feel like uh, we wouldn't have really been in Boston for real if it wasn't for you. So we're the sort of, I can 
So we oh, started wow. out in New Orleans. Of course you did, you can't tell. <laughs> so we're a New Orleans-based company and a New Orleans-based group of people. And um, and we feel very, like I don't know, I'm really passionate about uplifting stories of the South. Like that feels really important, even as like a lot of what's happening in the South is also mirroring all the, all the other places, especially when I'm thinking yeah. about the disappearing um, dyke. And I would even say like gay spaces too, like in general, like, bar and public spaces are um, that are like specifically gay, lesbian, LGBTQ run have like dwindled in the past, in the years um, and are harder to come about and stuff. And so, yeah, like me and our, one of our old collaborators, we were, we had just finished like working on alleged lesbian activities and got an amazing grant to like tour the work out. And we know that we didn't want to just like tour in this like traditional way where we just like take the show put our show up, say, come to see our show community and then leave. Like we really intentionally wanted to touch and like be in conversation with the uh, queer community in Boston. So um, yeah, we like were working with the theater offensive and had this little like, I forget what they were even doing, but I just like stood up and was like, hey, I'm like interested in trying to meet people who went to bars back in the seventies and the sixties. <laughs> Holler at me, and Danny happened to have been there at that TTO event, um, and was one of our and was our first interviewee, and it was yeah, it was just really special because I feel like <laughs> he, like you know we I'm not from Boston, so like I don't necessarily know who's there and stuff, so it felt really important to have connections specifically to people who um, were rooted in that place, from that place, had lived and like loved in that place um, as we continue to like see our work and and share our work with the community. Um, Cause yeah, this connection too, like we found, we were finding and we continue to find that that's really, that's really the meat and potatoes of this work. Like, yes, we love making theater. Yes, we love doing oral history and like talking to people about like spaces of the past. Um, like I get off on, like that's exciting to me. And I also like really appreciate the connections that I get to make um, through this work uh, and that's, kind of the origin story of Last Call too. This photo on the left is a, um, that's a picture of, of Alda Talley, who was one of our first interviewees in New Orleans. And from that one conversation sparked like more conversations with more people and more interviews. Like we were doing oral history before we really knew that we were doing oral history and um, which is exciting and like has taken us to this whole process of like solidifying and and refining our own practice that like so we can be at the place where now we can explain like these are the things that are important to us like it's it's important that our interviewees know what we're doing with their stories it's important that they know that they have a say over like what gets shared or doesn't get shared um and it's important that like yeah they know that we're more than just like trying to touch base once and like get your story and then leave um and the next thing you see is like i don't know some big production with like <laughs> You know, up to, up to that point, um, I um, I never really thought. I just live life from day to day and and do do, do what I do, you know, without thinking that it was important and made a difference. And um, that's when talking to you, I realized that I had I had such a charm, exciting, varied life. And um, I seen a thing on PBS about um, hazmat um, people that came in and cleaned up after people got shot or died or something. And um, it was a black gay guy whose apartment he had died of AIDS. And his apartment was filled to the brim with um, photo albums. You know, his whole life was all these photo albums all on the coffee table, everywhere. And um, they took a garbage bag and they emptied the, all the albums into the garbage bag and within minutes, it was like he never existed. He was never here. He was he was gone. And I didn't want, and I don't have any relatives, and I didn't want my life to end that way. So when you came up about recording your history, I thought how important that would be so others can, I might inspire somebody because of things that I've done, you know? And you made a difference to me, so I just had to thank you for that. And um, inspired me to, to, to and, and after that, I was, um, another group looked me up and dedicated a bench, a little memorial for me. They wanted to put a plaque on the nightclub, but they didn't want it. The owners of the place didn't want to put a plaque there. And um, 
so many other things happened since then. So thank you very much. It's so interesting because I feel like the way that we memorialize spaces can look very different. You know what I mean? Like I think it doesn't always look like plaques, which of course are important, and statues. All those things are very important. But I think it looks like, you know, um, the work that you're creating, Danny. It looks like the the like film that you're creating, Jordan. Yes. And like the theater projects that you're working on, Jackson, like I think, so, especially like, I think that is a very queer aesthetic, <laughs> whatever that is, it's like, like we don't necessarily have to adhere to like the normal plaques that like our plaques can sometimes look like these, these bits of artwork. Um, and, and sometimes our plaques are like, like, I don't know, they're fleeting. They don't, they're not always like permanent, which I think is a very beautiful like mirror to like how spaces have been historically as well um like right. lots of queer spaces like they go like some of them a lot of them don't sustain you know what i mean so it's important when right. we find the ones that have sustained and stuff like i felt really excited that we were able to um when we came to boston we did our show at jack's cabaret which right. is you know i'm like it has all its own which was like, amazing and nuance and history of that space you know what i mean and it's just been around for so long and so to be talking about um like lesbians in that space and like to bring like that energy back into that space, especially as like, um, from my understanding, like it's like shifted in the past few years. Um, and like, it's becoming more of a like, this is where bridal showers and bridal parties go to like celebrate and have their drag show, you know what I mean? And have like a fun drag night um, in honor of their great like cishet love, we love it. Um, and that's beautiful and they deserve that. And like, we love to see the girls working. And um, I don't know, I love like, I appreciate the nuance of being able to like hold some like queer femme energy in that space that, um, yeah, that's, maybe in being threatened by like cis normativity, <laughs> like taking it over. I, can I say that? I think I can say that, right? <laughs> that, like sometimes like cis straight stuff comes into like queer spaces and takes it over in ways. Um, but yeah, I just, I love hearing that you're working on stuff, Danny, and I love hearing did about- you, um, I like Did you see that picture of Jackson's um, picture of the, uh, of, the, of the other side? I didn't know which one was it. It was a club called the other side, which was oh, exactly in front, right in front of the docks. And that was the first gay club I went to. It was an article in the newspaper about men dancing with men. Wow. I was beat. beat. <laughs> it was a road run. I went right down there. But it was right across the street from, um, from the other side was across the street from Jocks. They faced each other. Yeah, right there. there it is. Jocks is right across the street. I remember this view. I know that little uh, there. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this Jocks in that building. That's that building right there was, was the other side. Oh wow. Yeah, the, the photographs are taken from different the building. Angles, which is and my, and the first time my sister ever went to a gay club, she came in and saw me dancing with another man, and she thought I was straight. The first time she ever came, I was like. Oh, why me? <laughs> and it happened right in that blue building. <laughs> I came out <laughs> involuntarily. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I love that. So there's so much history on that one little corner. Um, Ooh, I love. I know. That's, that's what we were finding in New Orleans, too, that there's like little circles, like little little routes that people would take to go to like the same little bars over and over. And they were just booming, booming um, lesbian bars. Like, and now there's no more lesbian bars. Uh, and we have even less, fewer and fewer, even gay boy bars outside of like, there's one little like Fruit Loop is what we still call it in the, uh, in the French Quarter area. But, and again, it's like, it's very touristy and for like folks who are coming into town and like visiting. Um, but even still, there's still like spaces for people like trans and like gender non-conforming folks like can carve out spaces within those little hubs too. So I don't know, I find that like, I don't know, even with even today, there's all these like hidden sub communities that are like thriving within these like spaces that are like dwindling in number and size. But we're still here, <laughs> we're still thriving, we're still, you know, having our little nights and et cetera, et cetera. So it's important. So uh, we have a, a couple of questions that we can, sure. we can kick off. 
Um, but I just want to let the audience know that if uh, anyone in the audience would like to ask a question, they can use the Q&A function, and we'll try to get to the questions that, that we can. Uh, and so the questions that we have um, are just sort of generic there for anyone, so whoever would like to speak, please, please jump in. Um, but uh, one thing that is sort of building off a little bit about what Indy was just talking about uh, is that uh, right now we're in a time where with the internet, uh, lots of things are changing, a lot of the physical spaces are going away and they're being replaced by online spaces. Um, and how does that change the way that you uh, document queer life um, and how is that going to change how you document queer life moving forward? Um, is this about sort of documenting your own stories or is it uh, without the, the landmark, you know, is it, is it possible to do the same type of documentation that you've done in the past? And um, I'll throw that open to, to anyone, but, um, you know, Jordan and Jackson, you're both uh, talking about spaces. Do you, does that sort of resonate with either of you? I don't know how anyone, I'm, gonna, I'm speaking from my own experience, my own perspective, of course, but when I hear the idea of the digital replacing the physical surface and that sort of dualism that's playing out, I don't think that's the whole history of queer spaces and the whole reality of what's happening to queer spaces. And I sometimes think that the digital can absolutely and authentically augment our physical reality in really meaningful and beautiful ways, but that doesn't diminish the importance of brick and mortar gathering spaces. And I, when I hear the digital surface as maybe a reason why queer spaces are not as important or uh, you know not as necessary. I that that to me does not feel like an authentic answer to the issue of contemporary queer space. Uh, like talking in, I think about like the city of Boston. We have a liquor license problem. Um, we're the only city in all of Massachusetts that has to go directly to legislature to appeal for a new liquor license, or we have to buy them within the city from someone who already possesses them. So that means something that should be $2,000 is now $400,000. When you're trying to open and maintain a queer space or a gay bar or whatever, that's impossible to maintain both overhead and access to a liquor license. So it's also the role that our government is playing in making sure that people do not have access to these spaces or it seems impossible and that we are relegated to digital space to gather and collectivize over and over and over again. So I think the digital in regards to archive has been pretty expansive. Um, in regards to like being able to cross pollinate, share ideas, share experiences. Um, but I think uh, that's only there to augment what is physically there and available for people as well. Thank I, you, um, Jordan. Honey? Do you want to go? Oh, yeah, I, well, it's sort of kind of almost, uh, I was recently, I have a, I'm mentoring a young 26 year old straight, straight fellow. And we went out to um, lunch the other day and this music was playing. I'm like, how do you all dance off of this music? What do you all do? It was, it was incomprehensible. I couldn't understand. I couldn't even slow down. And so he said, he said, well, he went to a club last night and they up in um, Mattapan. And they were, um, the men were hugging the walls and the girls were dancing with themselves and they never came together. I mean, well, how do y'all get pregnant? And um, you know, no one's communicating. And, and I, I, I'm afraid that <laughs> we're, we involve, we're involving, and I asked him, well, what, what do you think the future would be when he's an adult with, his, with the kids? He had no idea. And I can't fathom what it's going to be like with this electronic world coming in and and people can't communicate anymore. And it's a sad, sad, sad thought that digital would, I think, help with that. I'm not help, but hurt, you know, hinder, you know, the communication and touching the feeling like we need to have that. I don't know. I, I think, uh, I don't know if anyone here has read Legacy Russell's book, Glitch Feminism, um, but she talks about 
the potentiality, like the internet, not to get into this digital world too, this is dangerous. Um, but she talks about how the internet has been a gathering place for marginalized folks. Uh, and we just don't get to see that as often because, you know, when we're thinking about internet space, a lot of the time it is white space. And she talks about the potential of glitching uh, gender, glitching sexuality and using the digital to really augment our reality in really meaningful ways. Um, so I still think there's hope for the digital, but I don't think the digital uh, can replicate uh, physical reality. Um, I think it can augment it though. I think it can really enhance it if we use it in a way that's meaningful and not shittily. I don't know if I can say that here. Just, yeah, anyway. Yeah, I've searched, sorry, Jackson. Oh, thank you. I, I think that I would fully agree with what, what both of you are saying in different ways. And I mean, I'm someone who's academically trained as an art historian, um, you know, trained to write articles and books that 30 people will read. And so it was just such a pleasure uh, to have this opportunity <laughs> to collaborate with Boudoir. And, um, you know, they're all so, um, you know, um, energetic and talented and uh, avidly engaged with the historical record. I think of DJs as some of our best and most important historians and archivists and media archeologists and um, working with a team that is so media savvy um, and using poetry in a kind of subversive way, posting these poems on a nightlife platform, I think was just so, you know, such a beautiful gesture. And for me, it's really a question of, you know, marrying history with, with our present moment. And um, I, I, I fully believe that it's, it's through, um, you know, uh, parties such as Boudoir, for example, which is, you know, itself a response to the lack of dedicated queer spaces within the cityscape of Boston, um, where these histories can come alive. Um, and I, I, I see this resonating with what all of you are doing in, in different ways. Okay. So we have a, a couple questions from the audience. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one, uh, Peter asked, uh, no mention yet of a, of a special place for me, uh, the Paradise in Cambridge, met my first and only partner there in 1980, um, assuming it's closed. Uh, when um, when did it close uh, and when did it open? Uh, so I can say because I bike past Paradise every day uh, that it is definitely closed. <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> so it's closed. Uh, but um, I actually don't know when. It's now I think like uh, I think it's like a co-working space. Oh, okay. Um, so the building's being used and it still says Paradise. So the banners or the the awning's still up, uh, but it um, has is very much closed. Um, and I can research uh, when it actually closed. I'm sure we can dig that up. But um, uh, unless somebody knows off the top of the head, we can move on to the next question. There was an anonymous attendee who says, uh, I apologize for the negative spin, but Stonewall is up in my mind. Uh, were there any dangers in patronizing gay bars in Boston during the 70s and 80s uh, vis a vis mafia ownership rates, et cetera, either in Scully Square or the combat zone locations? So, uh, Danielle. Well, uh, um, I, I, never, I never experienced um, women, if I did. Um, what, what was the, um, oh God, what was that club? That, on, um, well, we would chase in a car hmm. through the Fenway. Um, it was altercation. My friend had a limousine service, and he we went to the club, and um, we were getting in the uh, the limousine, and um, right right near Fenway was a big big club. You know that club, Walter? Oh, second. No, it was, it was another one. No, no, it was, it was on the opposite side of Fenway Fenway Park. But anyway, um, Boston, Boston. Yeah, but we would chase um, with uh, the, the the doorman or somebody. Um, Pull out a gun and and um, and chase us, but that wasn't a for gay. That was that was just a racist thing, okay. But on my club, they the, the neighborhood, like I said, they were trying to burn down the club because we wouldn't let them in. And I, my club was also gay. It was a female and male, so it was a lesbian and everybody patronized that club at that time. But um, 
I really didn't experience racism as I did in Texas when I was in the service. They would come in and turn the lights on. Anybody had a military haircut, they would they would take them out, and you'd never see them again. So um, I, I experienced that there, but I didn't experience none of that here. That's just me. Uh, maybe others have other stories. So um, Jordan or Jackson, you guys have been working on documenting the stories. Um, I don't know if you have any uh, any comments on that. Yeah, there there was a lot of danger in the combat zone and in the financial district, for example, um, the lesbian bar, the saint never listed their uh, uh, contact information or uh, their, their phone number was actually gay community news. Um, and people would call it and um, it would be screened and then details about where you could find the, the bar um, uh, would, would be revealed. So um, there was just a lot of danger in these spaces. And I think that points to this question points to one of the dangers of uh, romanticizing these histories or, um, you know, the nostalgia that I think a lot of us have in, in various ways when we think about um, the age of gay liberation as being something that's a, a rosier moment um, compared to um, our present, right? So thank you for pointing that out. <laughs> and I think it's also important to know too that the violence wasn't just like an outsider thing coming in, you know, that like let's Danny is saying that like there was also a lot of racism and like a lot a of lot. spaces and uh, lesbian spaces of the past too, which is violence. So yes, I think I've I've also heard stories about like mafia presence and like tensions between like outsider like people like people couldn't walk home by themselves, you know what I mean? Like I've heard those stories both in Boston and in New Orleans. And I think I've also heard stories about like, yeah, just like the blatant racism that also those spaces held too. So it's not a, yeah, I agree. I think it's dangerous to rom romanticize it and it's to remember important to remember that, that it's like nuanced and it can be a, both a space, a complicated space in, in our past. I'm sorry, I remember in 1970, 71 or two, whatever the point of sisters first came out, there was the party of the year and it was with white people. <laughs> it was the first time anybody had mixed a party with blacks and whites. And I, I, I just can't believe that happened. It was, you know, there was a time that white people were going to be there. And, <laughs> and um, only the elite was, was invited to this party, okay? And I wasn't invited, but I crashed. <laughs> And they threw me in the, in the trash can anyway. That's another, that's another movie. Oh my God. But yeah, that's how the, 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 the um, climate was back then. The blacks and mixed here in Boston, they, you know, a few guys in, you know, mixed, but it wasn't, it wasn't a, a love fest, you know? And um, that, uh, it was 72. Did we come a long way, baby? And <laughs> Yeah, I also want to point out that Boston is, of course, home, Boston, Cambridge, is home to the trans panic defense. So this was a very dangerous place for trans people to navigate, especially. Oh, always. Yeah, so like, you know, thinking back Everywhere. not to past, yeah, the history, Chanel Pickett, uh, Rita Hester, like this was a, in Boston also does remain uh, a dangerous place for conforming people, especially people of color navigating our city, so. Thank you for that, Doctor. I think the only thing that I'll add is, um, I'm not specifically sure, and I wouldn't call this dangerous in a particular way, dangerous by the state, um, but there was a story from one of the oral histories we got from Boston where they were saying that like, folks with um, mental, like different mental abilities um, were just like released into the streets and they were saying that they would be in the neighborhood um just kind of around the area and i'm not trying to remember who exactly had told us the story um but it kind of speaks to like a, a multitude or a few different things actually of how like the state see, where, where certain things exist in the city um and how the state treats certain people and so one of the people who owned a bar would talk about how there would be folks of like varying abilities just kind of navigating the street um because the hospital had just kicked them out um, so I'm not saying like for the folks who have been released from the hospital were particularly dangerous to the queer and trans folks who were like patronizing these bars, but um, just as like a dangerous from the state type of um, point of view, I just wanted to list some of that. And I'm trying to remember what exactly all that was. 
Um, but it's not coming to my mind specifically. Well, um, we had a, an anonymous, another anonymous attendee said, um, do you have any advice for a group um, attempting to start a specifically queer space in a city like Boston? That's sort of looking forward rather than looking back, but uh, I'll throw that out and see if anyone has any, uh, any advice to, to pass on. Well, I, I just ran into a Friday, the, the opening night at Friday at the City Hall. Um, someone directed this young man to me, and he was black, he is black, and they said that Danny had me at the first black gay club, and he has a gay club now, and it's called The Legacy, and it's down at, um, 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 Worthington, I mean, Warrington Street? Yeah, Warrington Street, and I guess it's in the back. I don't know if anybody remembers the fan club. That was years ago. It was like Boston Studio 54. And I think it's, it's there in the back of the, the building, right across the street from the, the Wayne Center. The hotel is in the back. So it's a black club where he just opened it called The Legacy. So it's a very elegant place. I haven't been there yet. He wants me to come down and speak one night. So that's the newest one that I heard of. I, I do want to point out that our clock is five minutes fast, so. Okay. <laughs> it's a very nice clock, but it doesn't keep time very well. <laughs> uh, Jordan, Jackson, Natalie, Indy, do you guys, any of you have any um, advice to, to offer to people opening a queer space, or should we move on to another question? I think I want, you know, I'm not, oh, go ahead, Danny. You know, years ago in New York, there was a place called a, a garage. And uh, it was, people were still talking, but they still had reunions and stuff. And uh, it was straight and gay and uh, different nights. But um, they, did, they didn't have a liquor license. And they served uh, water and they had a big table in the center filled with bananas and fruit and stuff. And it was so successful. So I don't think we need a liquor license necessarily because I saw how that worked. It just had good music. Larry LeVan, who's a famous DJ, he, um, he was that's the origins. That's what he started from. And I think it can be done creatively. You don't have to follow the trap. You don't have to follow the path. You can start your own path and just get creative, you know? Your own circle of friends and then it'll get bigger and bigger and bigger. I think that can be done, you know? And that's why it's important to know history, okay? To see that it's been done before, okay? <laughs> I say, yeah. the, only, the only thing I was gonna add to that, to that Danny, was um, it's important to like lean into your community. Um, I think things are super successful when you have multiple people who are like supporting each other, who have many different skills. And there was a lot of that like inter support particularly in bars in New Orleans um, and bars everywhere where it's like, oh, you need ice? Let me come and like hook you up with some ice. Or, oh, you need security? You're going to come over there once our bar closes and everyone goes to you to dance because they came to us to pregame. Exactly, um, exactly. Um, yeah, yes. it's like being in community with fellow like patron, our bar owners, our like patrons, our, um, in general, being in deep community with people feels to like always be the best way to like build something and sustain it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Jackson, were you about to say something? Oh, I was just going to say, I think essentially the same thing, but the importance of intergenerational contact and learning. And um, as um, Danny said, uh, knowing history, being in dialogue with people who were around before you. Um, one of the reasons why I appreciate the work of Boudoir so much is that uh, they host a, a, a workshop um, uh, class uh, that is, teaching younger generations of DJs, um, you know, the tools of the trade. And I think that's really beautiful. Um, and it's because they've learned from, you know, DJs before them who, you know, are experts from earlier periods. And, and um, this type of uh, learning is so crucial to the queer experience and the trans experience. And um, I, I think that is really essential to, um, is starting a queer space or maintaining a queer space. Um, I can only speak to this from the perspective of a failed server. Um, <laughs> but like, uh, you know, no, knowing if you're working in community with other people, starting to get something off the ground, I think having experience in service and what it means to run something that is both successful 
um, but also empathetic to who is going to be in the space and taking care of it. Um, it, it makes people, if, if you care about people, they'll care about the space. And I think that sort of cross pollination between what it means to do labor um, instead of like idealizing music is so important, but what does it do to what it does it mean to really take care of a space, a brick and mortar space? I think changed my perspective of clubs in general. You're not going to get your drink on time, but I, you know, I'm going to try my best. You, you, ironically, Jordan, you know, I had a business called Men in Black. I just retired like last month. And um, <laughs> I, I provided bartenders and service to for private parties. I had a staff of thirty seven. <laughs> and I, it all started from e lights. That's where really, I started started from working there as a bartender. And, I love it. And I'm also a Japanese sushi chef, and I came back to do sushi. And they said, "I don't need no damn sushi. I need a bartender and a waiter." <laughs> That's <laughs> <what I'm gonna> <laughs> Yeah, I think I walked away being like, I know what a vodka soda is. I know what a vodka crayon is. But, uh, I think, you know, just understanding your community and their needs, even like the most basic necessity of needs, uh, like housing, food, like what people really, really, really need. Um, yes. Like idealizing it, I think makes for a great space. Yeah. yeah. Don't yeah. want sushi, just want vodka. Yeah. 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 And I think. The last little thing that I'll say, because I know we're coming up to the end of our time, is, yeah, like, I think so Boston's in this interesting place where, you know, it's really hard to get a liquor license, but I think Danny's right. Like, I think being flexible and creative about how to use that space, because also a thing that came out of all of our history around dyke bars is that, like, like people would always ask us, like, when, you, when are y'all opening your dyke bar? And, I, and we'd be like, well, do we actually need a bar space? Like, we definitely need space, physical space. I agree with that, but... I don't know, there was a lot of alcohol abuse and substance abuse and like all types of like different things that, you know, like people do for whatever reasons, like no shame, like no, like whatever. But like, if we're thinking about the holistic health of our larger community, I don't know if we do need another space that's centered around music. Okay. Um, right. We need space that's centered around us exactly. or, right. um, and a center around our needs as like, um, Jordan saying like yeah we need spaces to exist and spaces to be so also thinking about like ways to like have open hours where people don't have to pay anything to be there just like be there you know what I mean um, right, right. And, and, and like not having the pressure of being like I need to like I don't know sometimes people don't have places to be so that's what I think about too when I'm thinking about new spaces for queer folks and things yeah I, no I love I love that and I think you know, the city comes to queer organizations. Boston City loves to come to queer oriented organizations over a month like this for some reason um, and ask us if we want a, to paint a mural or, and I would say, I don't want to paint a mural. I want space. And I think that's like a universal demand throughout our whole country is we need space. Okay. Murals are great too. I like murals. <laughs> yes. Murals are beautiful and we love them and agree. We need space. <laughs> so I want to thank you all for a really great discussion. And I want to thank all of our audience members for joining us. Um, and just let people know if they have any additional questions, uh, they can always um, uh, contact us. Uh, at programs at masshist.org and we'll pass it on uh, to each of our panelists. So thank you all. And I hope you have a, a, a wonderful rest of the day. And I also wanna thank the History Project for being co-sponsors. So have a good evening.